And there's always that first ten minutes that's like smelling a dead fish or walking into a monkey house. And then something will click a little tiny bit, and that leads to something else. You force yourself to get going one sentence, two sentences, three, and little by little, you enter that other world. And you hit this kind of uh, escape velocity, you're gone. The world, the normal, mundane, sort of stupid world, all that's gone. Horror fiction, a lot of it, to me, is the lure of the forbidden. Oh, the forbidden. One of the things that I've tried to do is to keep my imagination young. I think that producers and filmmakers look for visual imagery. They look for simple stories, simple bright stories with high conflict, but I think that they're also seduced by visual imagery. Well, I think you ought to read a lot, and I think you ought to write a lot. And I mean, you have to write in order to develop a style, to create a style of your own. And when it comes to the reading part of it, there's a magic moment, a really magic moment. If you read enough, it will always come to you if you want to be a, a writer, where you put down some book and say, this really sucks. <laughs> I can do better than this. <laughs> You're saying to somebody, uh, come with me and I will say things to you that nobody else will say. But what is it that grabs an audience at the first level? Forbidden. Something forbidden. that's forbidden. So that you're saying to somebody, uh, come with me and I will say things to you that nobody else will say. And uh, I will show you things that nobody else that dares That are so to horrible to imagine. Show to you. That's right. Um, and again, it shares the same attraction as comedy. A movie that's really funny, that really makes people laugh, is generally saying, I'm going to show you something that you haven't seen before. So that when Mel Brooks did Blazing Saddles yeah. back in 74 or whatever it was, and the cowboys eat beans and then sit around the fire right. and they start to fart. Right. Well, nobody had ever heard anybody actually fart in a yeah. movie and we all fell on the floor laughing. You know, right. it made that movie. So it was something that had been previously forbidden. You know, we all know about it. Mm. We all know that people pass gas, but nobody had ever put it on the big screen before. And here, what are you doing? It's forbidden. Well, for instance, in, uh, Pet Cemetery, uh, what I said was, here's something that we don't talk about. People sometimes have kids who die. There are terrible things that happen, um, and sometimes a child will die young. And in Pet Cemetery, that happened, and I followed the family through the grieving process, and then the father goes out to the graveyard and digs his, his son up and tries to bring him back to life. And the important part about it, you know, I, I like to say that Fiction is a lie, but good fiction is the truth inside the lie. And the truth that any person who's ever lost a child knows is that you wish you could bring them back to life. Mm -hmm. And the story explores what might happen if something like that could, could happen. So horror fiction, a lot of it, to me, is the lure of the forbidden. Oh, the forbidden. The best description of writing a novel that I ever heard uh, is actually in uh, Thomas Williams' book, uh, uh, the hair of Harold Rue. But he says that writing a novel is like building a little campfire on an empty, dark plain. And one by one, these characters come out of the dark and each one has a little pile of wood and they put it on the fire. And if you're very lucky before the fire goes out, it's this big bonfire and all the characters stand around it and warm themselves. And that's the way it's always been for me. His father, a merchant seaman, skipped out when Stephen was only two. He has no memory of him. But he left mm -hmm. that box, a box in the attic that would change his life. There were uh, like cocktail napkins from Tokyo, little hula hula dolls from somewhere in the South Pacific. There were those things. But there was also an H.P. Lovecraft book and it showed this horrible green monster rising from a, a broken open grave in a graveyard. And I thought, this is it. You know, whatever it is, something chimes in you and you say, I found something that resonates with my soul. One of the things that I've tried to do is to keep my imagination 
young. What kind of books do you write? Well, if you ask the ordinary run-of-the-mill reader, if there is such a guy or such a gal, I guess that I write uh, horror novels. I think that what I actually write are suspense novels. And what's the difference? I think that uh, the purpose of the horror novel is to sort of gross you out. My idea of it is, and I, I'm not averse to this, I will do this, it's part of the fun of it, is it's kind of, uh, at the, uh, it's a childish thing, the way that humor is. The two things are closely allied. They both elicit, when they work to their best, a, a, a vocal reaction from the audience. Laughter, if it's comedy, and a, a scream or a, a yell, if it's, if it's horror. But it's, they're both childish, and uh, it's kind of like uh, when you're a kid and you're sitting at the dining room table and you want to get your, to your sister or your brother, you kind of chew up your food and then, ah, you hang your <laughs> mouth open like that. Yes. <laughs> that's horror. Suspense is a little more high class than that, so maybe that's why My I mother used to say that was tasteless. That's tasteless. Yeah, that's right. Well, my mother, when I was a kid, used to say, Stephen, your taste is all in your mouth. <laughs> and that's true, but it has made me relatively wealthy. <laughs> I don't think that y you find them exactly. I think that what you do is you keep your sensors open, and it's... The more that you do the job, the more you come to understand in a kind of intuitive way that you're always, you know, your radar is on and the thing is going around and around and around and it's not picking up any blips. And then something will happen and it will click and you'll say, this is, this is an idea for a story. And for me, uh, I'm usually working on something, so that's kind of got to go to the end of the line. And the best thing about that is, is that the bad ideas kind of just drop out of the mix. You forget about them, the good ones stick around, mm -hmm. so. Well, anyway, I, I had a Honda because I didn't know any better. And, uh, and I got it out in the spring when the snow was gone from Maine, and, and I started it up, and it just, it wasn't right. It just wasn't running right. And uh, somebody told me, well, you go on up to this guy's farm. He's got a, uh, you probably know where this is going. <laughs> uh, he said, go on up. This guy's got a little garage adjacent to his farm. And he's got this unique way of doing things. He tells you what it's going to cost, and that's what it costs. So I went up, and about halfway to this farm, which was way out in East Overshoe, the, um, the motor started to skip. And uh, by the time I got to the farm, it was barely running at all, and it died as I pulled into the, uh, into the guy's dooryard. That's what we call it in Maine, a dooryard. So I'm on my motorcycle, and the motorcycle is dead. And from this garage came the biggest goddamn St. Bernard you ever saw in your life. <laughs> And the guy came out, the mechanic came out, and the dog's going, Arr. and it's got that stuff coming out of his eyes, you know, the way that St. Bernard's do. And he said, don't worry, Buster is very friendly. And Buster weighed about 250 pounds. <laughs> and so I walked over toward Buster, and his haunches just sort of coiled down, and his teeth came out. And he actually started to go for me. And the guy brought a socket wrench down on his hind end. And uh, the dog sat still. And I thought I might get an apology, but the guy looked at me and just said, Buster must not have liked your face. <laughs> so he fixed my motorcycle, and I wrote a book called Cujo. And, uh, <laughs> and it worked out. Yeah. Now, why do you think yours have translated to film so well? I think that producers and filmmakers look for visual imagery. They look for simple stories, simple bright stories with high conflict, but I think that they're also seduced by visual imagery. And My books are visual because I grew up on TV, I grew up on the movies, and I also grew up on images poetry. This is the T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. Do you write every day? Yeah. Which includes today. Yeah. You wrote today. I did. I'm glad we didn't interrupt. Where in the cycle are you of book production? Well, I, I finished a novel, and uh, I am letting it 
marinate a little bit. You have to get away from it a little while. It's too easy if you finish something and go right back into it to either say, this is terrible, or what's even worse, to say, my, I really wrote a good job. This is great. I'll probably win the Pulitzer Prize for this. I started to send stories out, and, uh, and I pounded a nail into the wall of my bedroom. And when I got the rejection slips back, I would put them on that nail. And by the time that I was 16 or 17 years old, uh, the nail tore free from the plaster. So I just got a bigger nail. And I thought when I wrote The Shining, I said, I have this wonderful idea about this family in this haunted hotel. And what they really want is the boy with psychic powers. And at the end of the book, the hotel will kind of absorb him. And then we'll see the next year, we'll see the whole family as ghosts. But it didn't turn out that way. I, I feel like you have to follow the characters and you have to follow the story where it leads. And the last thing that I want to do is to spoil a book with plot. So, <laughs> you know, I think, I think the plot, that plot is the last resort of bad writers as a rule. I'm a lot more interested in character and situation and you follow it where it goes. And the way that, that, the way that I work, uh, I try to get out there and I try to get six pages a day. So with a, a book like End of Watch, and I work, when I'm working, I work every day, uh, three, four hours, and I try to get those six pages and I try to get them fairly clean. So if the manuscript is, let's say, 360 pages long, that's basically two months' work. It's concentrated, but it's a fairly... But that's assuming that it goes well. And you do hit six pages a day? I usually do. You force yourself to get going one sentence, two sentences, three, and little by little, you enter that other world. <laughs> yes? Um, I was just wondering what advice you would give young people who are considering careers as writers. <laughs> I guess you should buy your book. <laughs> well, I think you ought to read a lot, and I think you ought to write a lot. And those are really the two major things. You can't put it off. You, you have to, uh, you have to really do the work. You have to be, you have to be well read. I don't have any patience with people who say, oh man, I want to be a writer, but I don't have time to read. Well, if you don't have time to read, you can't be a writer. You've got to read just about everything. So I think that that's the most important thing. And then you have to, you have to read, and I mean, you have to write in order to develop a style, to create a style of your own. And when it comes to the reading part of it, there's a magic moment. A really magic moment, if you read enough, that will always come to you if you want to be a, a writer, where you put down some book and say, this really sucks. <laughs> I can do better than this. <laughs> and, and this got published. <laughs> to develop as a writer, you must be reading books constantly. Here are a few suggestions. The Shining, Carry, Salem's Lot, Pet Cemetery, Dolores Claiborne, The Green Mile, Under the Dome. You get the idea. People will say, do you keep a notebook? And the answer is, I think a writer's notebook is the best way in the world to immortalize bad ideas. Uh, <laughs> my idea about a good idea is one that sticks around and sticks around and sticks around. It's like, to me, it's like, if you were to put breadcrumbs in a strainer and shake it, which is what the passage of time is for me, it's like shaking a strainer. All this stuff that's not very big and not very important just kind of dissolves and falls out. But the good stuff stays, you know, the big pieces stay. Um, I had the idea for Under the Dome uh, when I was teaching high school back in 1973, and it was just too big for me, and I was too young for it. And uh, I wrote about 25, 26 pages and uh, put it away. So the good stuff stays. So does that, does that mean that writing can be um, taught, can be learned? It can be learned, but I'm not sure it can be taught. It's a self-taught kind of thing. I think the, the best writers are, are uh, voracious readers who pick up the cadences and the feel of narration through a number of different books and you begin by maybe copying the style of writers that really knocked you out. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as a teenager, 
I read a lot of H.P. Lovecraft, so I wrote like H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. And when in my 20s, I read a lot of uh, Ross McDonald and Raymond Chandler, so I wrote like those guys. But little by little, you develop your own style. Now, I have a routine because I think that writing is self-hypnosis, and you fall into a, uh, uh, a kind of a trance if you do the same passes um, over and over. So I'll get up, uh, have some breakfast with my wife, uh, watch CNN, and then I'll make my pot of tea and sit down and write for about three and a half hours. I started with short stories when I was 18. I uh, sold my first one when I was about 20. The short stories were making money, and I got very comfortable with that format, and I've never wanted to leave it completely behind. And what happens to me a lot of times is I will start out saying this would be a terrific short story idea, and it balloons and becomes a novel. Uh, Misery started as a short story, and uh, Gerald's Game started as a short story. Those were things that I thought would be small and grew to a size where they would be a novel. And I also think that, uh, that uh, what happens when you sleep is your screen is refreshed. It's like by the end of the day, have you ever noticed if you leave your uh, computer on, after a while to save energy or something, the screen darkens. Yeah. But if you move the cursor around, it immediately brightens up again. It mm -hmm. kind of refreshes itself. I think that when you sleep, uh, the very dreaming process, I'm just guessing now, hey, this is all just speculation, but I do think that sleeping refreshes the process. But yeah, I've had a few ideas in my sleep. For a long time, I felt like movies were a lesser medium because it's like skating. It's all on the surface. Uh, every now and then some movie will be reduced to doing a voiceover, you know, where this character is talking and I can just kind of To get go the like, interior life. Yeah. yeah. And I just kind of go, no, 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 you've clearly mistaken this medium for something that it's not. But I came to realize that films have a, a language of their own and you have to learn that language and it isn't enough to say, well, I've watched movies my whole life. You have to write a couple. But the thing is, you learn. You learn little by little, so. Do you re release books differently now than you used to? In that, like, do, you, do you have a different definition of what a successful book is? Or, or on the eve of a book's release, do you pay, pay a special kind of attention to how it will be received or how it's being reviewed? I think that if you spend too much time worrying about what the audience is going to like, that they're not going to like anything that you do. I just look for ideas that I really enjoy, something that I really want to live with for a while, like the story about the people under the dome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get into it most of the time, and then I just have a, a ball. I never finished a book and felt like I'm glad that's done. I usually finish a book and say, geez, I don't want to say goodbye to these people. Mm -hmm. And if the people who read it feel the same way, then, then I'm really happy. All I know is that I sit down and I turn on the machine, and there's always that first... 10 minutes that's like smelling a dead fish or walking into a monkey house. And then something will click a little tiny bit, and that leads to something else. And it's like choo 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 until it's going faster and faster. And then you hit this kind of uh, escape velocity. You're gone. The world, the normal, mundane, sort of stupid world where you got to do the breakfast dishes and you got to make the beds, you know, and you got to worry about getting the kid to the dentist. All that's gone.